It is remarkable that in this first edition of The Winter's Walk, the concluding line is much more Johnsonian than it was afterwards printed. For, in subsequent editions, after praying Stella to snatch him to his arms, he says, And shield me from the ills of life. Whereas in the first edition it is, And hide me from the sight of life. A horror at life in general is more cons consonant with Johnson's habitual gloomy cast of thought. I have heard him repeat with great energy the following verses, which appeared in the Gentleman's Magazine for April this year. But I have no authority to say that they were his own. Indeed, one of the best critics of our age, probably Malone, suggests to me that the work word indifferently being used in the senses without concern, and being also very poetical, renders it improbable that they should have been his composition. Well, okay, I'll let you know. I screwed up that footnote there. The best critic of our age, there's a footnote that says, in brackets, probably Malone, which means... The editor of this book, not Boswell, is saying that Boswell is probably re referring to Malone there. Aren't you glad you asked? Anyway, here's the poem. On Lord Lovett's Execution. Pitied by gentle minds, Kilmarnock died. The brave Melmurno were on thy side. Radcliffe, unhappy in his crimes of youth, steady in what he still mistook for truth, beheld his death so decently unmoved, the soft lamented and the brave approved. But Lovett's fate indifferently we view. True to no king, to no religion true. No fair forgets the ruin he has done, no child laments the tyrant of his son. No Tory pities thinking what he was, no Whig compassions, for he left the cause. The brave forgot not, for he was not brave. The honest mourn not, knowing him a knave. These verses are somewhat too severe on the extraordinary person who is the chief figure in them, for he was undoubtedly brave. His pleasantry during his solemn trial, in which, by the way, I have heard Mr. David Hume observe that we have one of the very few speeches of Mr. Murray, now Earl of Mansfield, authentically given, was very remarkable. When asked if he had any questions to put to Sir Edward Faulkner, who was one of the strongest witnesses against him, he answered, I only wish him joy of his young wife. And after a sentence of death in the horrible terms and e cases of treason was pronounced upon him, and he was retiring from the place. It was, I'm sorry, he was retiring from the bar. He said, Fare ye well, my lords, we shall not all meet again in one place. He behaved with perfect composure at his execution and called out, Dulce et decorum et probo patria more. To die for fatherland is a sweet thing in becoming. Quoting Horace, of course. Apparently the only Latin writer ever. Anyway. This year, his old pupil, Johnson we're talking about again, and friend, David Garrick, having become... And that's kind of his nemesis at this time period, remember, David Garrick, he's a actor of some renown, and Johnson's a little jealous of him for being successful. His old pupil and friend, Derek Garrick, having become joint patinee and manager of Dury Lane Theatre, Johnson honored his opening of it with a prologue, which, for just and manly dramatic criticism on the whole range of the English stage, as well as for poetical ex excellence, is unrivaled. My my friend, me being Boswell, Mr. Courtenay, 
whose eulogy on Johnson's Latin poetry has been inserted in this work, is no less happy in praising his English poetry. And I will, I will quote from Mr. Cordonet. But hark, he sings, the strains of po Pope's admires. Indignant virtue, her own bard inspires. Sublime as juvenile, he pours his lays. And with the Roman shares, congenial praise. In glowing numbers now, he fires the age. And Shakespeare's son looms the clouded stage. Okay. Like the celebrated epilogue to the distressed mother, it was, during this season, often called for by the audience. This is the prologue of Johnson. The most striking and brilliant passages have been so often repeated and are so well recollected by all the lovers of the drama and of poetry that it would be superfluous to point them out. In the Gentleman's Magazine for December this year, he inserted an ode on winter, which I think an admirable specimen of his genius for lyric poetry. But the year 1747 is distinguished as the epic, when Johnson's arduous and important work, his Dictionary of the English Language, was announced to the world by the publication of its plan or prospectus. How long this immense undertaking had been the object of his contemplation I do not know. I once asked him by what means he had attained to that astonishing knowledge of our language, by which he was enabled to realize a design of such extent and accumulated difficulty. He told me that it was not the effect of particular study, but that it had grown up in his mind insensibly. I have been... Wow. There's not a... Oh, there's one tiny footnote on this page. I have been informed by Mr. James Dodsley the, that several years before this period, when Johnson was one day sitting in his brother Robert's shop, he heard his brother suggest to him that a dictionary of the English language would be a work that would be well received by the public. That Johnson seemed at first to catch at the proposition, but after a pause said in his abrupt, decisive manner, I believe I shall not un undertake it. That he, however, had bestowed much thought upon the subject before he published his plan is evident from the enlarged, clear, and accurate views which it exhibits. And we find him mentioning in the tract that many of the writers whose testimonies were to be produced as authorities were selected by Pope, which proves that he had been finished, furnished, probably by Mr. Robert Dudley, with whatever hints that eminent poet had contributed towards a great literary project that had been the subject of important consideration in a former reign. <clears throat> the uh, booksellers who contacted, who contracted with Johnson, single and unaided, for the execution of a work which in other countries had not been affected but by the cooperating exertions of many, were Mr. Robert Dodsley, Mr. Charles Hitch, Mr. Andrew Miller, the two Monsieurs Longman, and the two Monsieurs Napton. The price stipulated was £1,575. The plan was addressed to Philip Dormer, Earl of Chesterfield, then one of His Majesty's principal secretaries of state, a nob nobleman who was very ambitious of literary distinction and who, upon being informed of the design, had expressed himself in terms very favorable to its success. There is, perhaps, in everything of any consequence, a secret history which it would be amusing to know, could we have it authentically communicated. Johnson told me on September 22nd, 1777, going from Ashbourne to Derbyshire to see Islam, wherever Islam is, Sir, the way at which the plan of my dictionary came to be inscribed to Lord Chesterfield was this. I had neglected to write it by the time appointed. Dodsley suggested a desire to have it addressed to Lord Chesterfield. I laid hold of this as a pretext for a delay, that it might be better done and let Dodsley have his desire. 
I said to my friend, Dr. Bathurst, Now, if any good comes of my addressing to Lord Chesterfield, it will be ascribed to deep policy when, in fact, it was only a casual excuse for laziness. Lazy man, that Johnson. It is worthy of observation that the plan has not only the substantial merit of comprehension, perpetuity, and precision, but that the language of it is ex unexceptionally excellent, it being altogether free from that inflation of style and those uncommon but apt and energetic words which is some of his writing have been censured, which more petulance than justice, with more pestilence than justice. And never was there a more dignifying strain of compliment than that in which his courts the attention of one who, he had been persuaded to believe, would be a respectable patron. <clears throat> With regard to the question of purity or propriety, says he, now this is Johnson talking, I was once in doubt whether I should not attribute to myself too much in attempting to decide then them, and whether my province was to extend beyond the proposition of the question, and the display of the suffrages of each side. But I have been since determined by your lordship's opinion to interpose my own judgment, and shall therefore endeavor to support what appears to be most in consonant to grammar and reason. A sunniest thought that modesty forbade him to plead inability for tasks to which Caesar had judged him equal. Curme posse nigam posse quad ille potet. Translated. Why should I say that I cannot do what he reckons that I can? From Asonius Epigram 1, 12. <clears throat> and I may hope, my lord, that since you, whose authority in our language is so generally acknowledged, have commissioned me to declare my own opinion, I shall be considered as exercising a kind of vicarious jurisdiction, and that the power which might have been denied to my own claim will be readily allowed me as the delegate of your lordship. This passage proves that Johnson's addressing his plan to Lord Chesterfield was not merely a consequence of the return of a report by means of Dodsley that the Earl favored the design, but that there had been a particular communication with his lordship concerning it. Dr. Taylor told me that Johnson went to his plan to him, sent his plan to him in manuscript for his perusal. And then when it was lying upon his table, Mr. William Whitehead happened to pay him a visit and being shown in was highly pleased with such parts of it as he had time to read and begged to take it some home with him, which he was allowed to do that from him it got into the hands of a noble lord who carried it to Lord Chesterfield. Footnote here from somebody not Boswell. Perhaps the lord was William, 3rd Earl of Jersey. <clears throat> when Taylor observed this might be an advantage, Johnson replied, No, sir, it would have come out with more bloom if it had not been seen before by anybody. The opinion conceived of it by another noble author appears from the following extract of a letter from the Earl of Orrery to Dr. Birch. Caledon, December 30th, 1747. I have just now seen the specimen of Mr. Johnson's dictionary addressed to Lord Chesterfield. I am much pleased with the plan, and I think the specimen is one of the best that I have ever read. Most specimens discuss rather than prejudice us in favor of the work to follow. But the language of Mr. Johnson's is good, and the arguments are properly and moderately, modestly expressed. However, some expressions may be cavilled at, but they are trifles. I'll mention one, the barren laurel. The laurel is not barren in any sense whatever. It bears fruit and flowers. Said hey sunt nuge, but they are trifles. And I have great expectation from the performance. That's from the Birch Manuscript in the British Museum. 
That Johnson was fully aware of the arduous nature of the undertaking, he acknowledges, and shows himself perfectly sensible of it in the conclusion of his plan. But he had a noble conscientiousness of his own sensibilities, which enabled him to go on with undaunted spirit. Dr. Adams found him one day busy in his dictionary when the following dialogue ensued. Adams. This is a great work, sir. How are you to get all of the etymologies? How are you to get all of the etymologies? Johnson. Why, sir, here's a shelf with Janus and Skinner and others. And there's a Welsh gentleman who has published a collection of Welsh proverbs who will help me with the Welsh. Adams. But, sir, how can you do this in three years? Johnson. Sir, I have no doubt that I can do it in three years. Adams. But the French Academy, which consists of 40 members, took 40 years to compile their dictionary. Johnson. Sir, thus it is. This is the proportion. Let me say. 40 times 40 is 1600. As 3 to 1600, so it is the prop proportion of an Englishman to a Frenchman. Oh! This. With so much ease and pleasantry could be talk of that prodigious labor which he had undertaken to execute. The public has, for, has had from another pen, see John Hawkins's Life of Johnson, the inferior copy, a long detail of what had been done in the country by prior lexiconographers. Lexo lexicongraphers. You know what I mean. And no doubt Johnson was wise to avail himself of them so far as they went. But the learned yet judicious research of etymology, the various yet accurate display of definition, and the rich collection of authorities were reserved for the superior mind of our great philologist. For the mechanical party employed, as he told me, six ammunices. And let it be remembered by the natives of North Britain, to whom he is supposed to have been so hostile, that five of them were of that country. There were two Menshires, Macbean, Mr. Shields, who we shall hereafter see partly wrote The Lives of the Poets, to which the name of Sipper is affixed. Mr. Stewart, son of Mr. George Stewart, bookseller at Edinburgh. And Mr. Maitlian. The sixth of these humble assistants was Mr. Peyton, who, I believe, taught French and published some elementary tracts. To all these painful labors, Johnson showed a never-ceasing kindness as far as they stood in need of it. The elder Mr. McBean had afterwards the honor of being librarian to Archibald, Duke of Argyll, for many years, but was left without a shilling. Johnson wrote for him a preface to a system of ancient geography, and by the favor of Lord Turlow, got him admitted a poor brother of the Charter House. For Childs, who died of a consumption, he had much tenderness. And it has been thought that some choice sentences of the lives of the poets were supplied by him. Peyton, who reduced to penury, penury has frequent aid from the bounty of Johnson, who at least was at the expense of, who at last was at the expense of burying both him and his wife. While the dictionary was going forward, Johnson lived part of the time in Holborn, Pardon Go Square, Fleet Street, and he had an upper room fitted up like a counting house for the purpose in which he gave to the copyist there several tasks. The words, partly taken from other dictionaries and partly supplied by himself, having been first written down with spaces left between them, he delivered in writing their etymologies, definitions, and various significations. The authorities were copied from the books themselves, in which he had marked the passages with a black lead pencil, the traces of which could easily be effaced. I have seen several of them in which the trouble had not been taken, so that they were just as when used by the copyists. It is remarkable that he was so attentive in the choice of the passages in which words were author authorized that one may read page after page of his dictionary with improvement and pleasure. And it should not pass unobserved that his, he has quoted no author whose writings had a tendency to hurt sound religion and morality. 
I will stop there for today. Bye from Boswell.